If you watched last week's video, you saw me collaborating with Twisted Fate Brewing in Danvers, Massachusetts to brew a seven barrel batch of a hazy New Zealand style IPA. And it was an awesome experience. Today, I'm gonna to be showing you how to make that exact same beer scaled down on the homebrew level, where we go through the grain of glass for that. Be sure to check out last week's video if you haven't seen it. It's a really fun expose into the differences between commercial brewing and home brewing and how you can take the exact same recipe for a home brewer, scale it all the way up to a commercial brewery and see slight differences and similarities in the two beers. I had a ton of fun with Dave brewing on his system and just having a good old time. But today, I'm gonna take you guys through how to brew this beer on your own system. It's a delicious beer. Those New Zealand hops really come through in a really neat way. And it's something that I think you're really going to enjoy. The recipe that Dave and I came up with is a combination of my own experience brewing hazy IPAs and his. And there's two slightly different approaches that we have uh, for brewing these types of beers. His are excellent and I've been very happy with mine. Um, but what happened was kind of an amalgamation of the two things. So it's gonna be pretty cool to see what it turns out to be like at the homebrew scale. This is the recipe that we agreed upon. We're starting out with five pounds of Dingemann's Belgian Pilsner malt. Uh, so normally I'm not used to using Belgian Pilsner malt in a uh, hazy IPA. I just normally default to whatever, but it makes a lot of sense. The Belgian Pilsner malt's a little bit breadier, a little bit different tasting flavor than uh, American Pilsner malt. So it should be cool to see if that makes an impact. We're gonna add to that four pounds of Dingemann's Pale Ale malt. Uh, again, Belgian pale ale malt. Next, we're gonna be adding in about 30% flaked grains here. The flaked grains contain lots of protein. They contain uh, things that are gonna help create the haze, have stable haze, and then also it's gonna help that head retention quite a bit, and it's also going to help make that mouth feel nice and smooth and creamy and full. We're gonna be doing just over two and a half pounds each of flaked oats and flaked wheat. So two pounds, six ounces. Then we will add to that about half a pound of white wheat malt, which is gonna help further amplify that body. Lastly, we're gonna add something really cool, something that I had never thought of doing for a hazy IPA, but makes a lot of sense. Uh, so we're adding about four ounces of Crystal 100. This is about a 45 Lava Bond Crystal Malt, but the English or the European version of it. Uh, what this is gonna do is it's gonna add a little color to the hazy IPA. Instead of it being super pale, uh, like I'm kind of used to making them, um, this is gonna turn it slightly orange and it's gonna give it a little bit of depth of flavor, I think, too. I wouldn't say it's gonna be a deep orange, but it's going to definitely not be as pale of hazy IPAs you might be uh, expecting. Sometimes using specialty malts, which I think are kind of out of vogue in the hazy IPA realm. I don't pay too much attention, but in the good old days, having a beer that was orange was acceptable. <laughs> and now today I see things that are yellow everywhere and I'm like, why is everybody trying to do the same thing? Now I picked out all the New Zealand hops in this beer, but there's one exception to New Zealand hops in this one. And that is a quarter ounce of sots going in for mash hops. The reason why we're using Sots is because Sots is a hop that has a very high amount of bound thiols in it. These are compounds that, without getting too deep into the science, basically produce a really cool fruity character in the beer when they're liberated from the hop themselves. There are enzymes in the mash that will help take care of that, so that's why we add mash hops in this particular stage. You can also use a thiolized yeast to get the same effect, but we're gonna be using a classic New England style IPA yeast instead, so this is how we elected to get the thiol into the beer. Now normally Dave doesn't add anything during the boil for hops, uh, but we decided to do something fun at zero minutes. Uh, we're just gonna add a little tiny bit of each hop at zero minutes. So this accounts to like something like one pellet of each hop when it comes down to the uh, home proof scale. At the pro scale, it's like a half a bucket. But at the end of the day, this isn't really gonna do anything, but it's kind of a fun little thing. So feel free to incorporate it if you want to, but otherwise, don't worry about it. The real addition of hops though comes at the Whirlpool. So once that boil is finished, we will drop the temperature of the wort down to about 175 degrees, and we're gonna hold a Whirlpool for 25 Five minutes. We're going to be circulating one ounce each of Nectaron, Racao, and Waimea in the Whirlpool the whole time. The 25 minutes is a slightly longer than usual Whirlpool, but 175 degrees is also a lower temperature for the Whirlpool. The goal here is to extract less bitterness and more flavor out of these hops in the process. And then once that's finished, we'll knock out, we'll head to the kettle. And then there's gonna be two dry hops on this beer. The first one will be on day three uh, during active fermentation. I'm gonna add an ounce and a half of Nectaron as a dry hop there. We'll let that sit on the beer for another three to four days. And then I'll do a soft crash, bringing it down to about 55 degrees Fahrenheit to stop the yeast from fermenting any further. This will drop the yeast out. It'll drop some of that early dry hop material out. We'll separate the beer off of the yeast and the hops. And then we'll add our our second dry hop on day eight. 
The second dry hop is going to be huge. This is gonna be four ounces of Nectaron, three ounces of Racal, and one ounce of Waimea going in at day eight. And they will sit on the beer for about another three to four days. Then we'll separate the beer off of those dry hops, we'll package, and we will let it condition and get it ready shortly after that. For the water profile on this beer, I'm gonna be using Dave's preferred hazy IPA water profile, which I absolutely trust. So this is going to be 95 parts per million of calcium, three parts per million of magnesium, 34 parts per million of sodium, 156 parts per million of chloride, 88 parts per million of sulfate, and 16 parts per million of bicarbonate. That's as close as I could get it based off of RO water. To get that water profile, I'm gonna be starting out with eight gallons, maybe eight and a half gallons actually, of reverse osmosis water. Just due to the large amount of hops in this beer, you're gonna have a lot of absorption and kind of, it's gonna take up a lot more volume than your average beer. Now we're gonna to add to that seven grams of calcium chloride, two grams of sodium chloride, one gram of Epsom, and four grams of gypsum. The effect of this water profile though is that you get this very high chloride to sulfate ratio, which really helps smooth that beer out, reduce the bitterness, and give you this really, really nice juicy hop flavor. The high sodium and calcium content in this water profile also are gonna help round out that mouthfeel. For the yeast in this beer, I'm gonna be using a tried and true classic hazy IPA strain, London Ale 3. We're actually gonna be using the White Labs version of that, which is London Fog, WLP 066. This is what Dave has on supply at the brewery, so there's no need to change it. We're gonna be using the same exact yeast, um, although the only difference is his is a dry pitch and mine is a liquid pitch. So it will be interesting to see if there's any differences based on that alone. And lastly, for the mashing this beer, we're gonna be mashing this one at 155 degrees Fahrenheit. That's a relatively high temperature, but it is important to get us that fullness, that body, and I think a reasonably high finishing gravity to keep the sweetness there, uh, to bolster all of that hop flavor and make it juicy and really bring out the unique characteristics of these New Zealand hops. I'm really excited to see what happens with this one. It should be just an explosion of tropical fruit, of stone fruit and like peach and that kind of thing. I think it's gonna have like a little bit of like a woody citrus note from the Waimea as well. So it should be a really cool blend and I'm excited to see what happens. So without further ado, let's get brewing. I started out by adding eight and a half gallons of reverse osmosis water into my 10 gallon 240 volt claw hammer supply system and I started to raise that up to the mash temperature of 155 degrees Fahrenheit. As this was going on, I measured out my water salts and I added those into the strike water as it was heating up and I also milled out all of my grain with the exception of the flaked grains uh, as those would get added in later on in the process. Once my strike water had reached the target temperature, I mashed in with the entire grain bill and I also added in my quarter ounce of saws going in for the mash hops and stirred those up thoroughly. I let the mash recirculate for only about 10 minutes before pulling a pH measurement, finding it to be about 5.1, which was actually exactly where I wanted it. Because we're adding so many dry hops later on in the process, that's actually gonna raise the pH of the beer at the end of the process quite a bit. So we can kind of counteract that a little bit by targeting a slightly lower than usual mash pH, uh, and that will actually help keep the beer in balance at the end of the process. The mash continued for a full hour before I raised up to a mash out temperature of 170 degrees Fahrenheit and held it there for about 15 minutes before then pulling out the grain basket and beginning my boil. I let the grain basket drain for about 15 minutes and then I removed it and carried on to a full boil. I boiled for an hour and then at the zero minute mark I added in one pellet each of Nectaron, Racao, and Waimea just for fun. However, at this point, we started knocking out to a whirlpool, so dropped everything down to 175 degrees and added in one ounce each of Nectaron, Racao, and Waimea. I left the pump running and recirculating the hops for about 15 minutes, then turned the pump off and let the hops pile up in the center of the kettle for the remaining 10 minutes. So our total whirlpool time was 25 minutes. Once that 25 minute whirlpool was complete, I continued the chill in a single pass through my counterflow chiller on into my Spike CF5 and got everything chilled down to a nice pitching temperature of about 65 degrees. Once the chill was complete, I added in my uh, starter made out of a single packet of White Labs WLP 066 London Fog and left it to ferment. Uh, 
I pulled a gravity sample and found it to be significantly below target at 1061. We were expecting an OG of about 1069. The reason for this is because I failed to account for the extra half gallon of water that I added and should have scaled up my grist accordingly. Uh, instead, I just added extra water. So that diluted the whole thing and was completely unnecessary. For the fermentation on this beer, it's gonna be complicated. See, these beers are easy to ferment, but the dry hop makes them complicated. So we're gonna be, first of all, fermenting this one at the upper end of the range on London Ale 3, which is gonna be about 69 degrees. Uh, we're fermenting there at the higher end to get a little bit more fruity ester out of the yeast. I'll be using, again, WLP 066 London Fog, which is the White Labs version of this strain, um, but you are absolutely able to use YU's 1318 Imperial Juice. Uh, any of the London Ale 3 strains that are pretty well known will do the exact same thing. The fermentation for this beer shouldn't take too long, maybe a week or two in total, uh, but timing the dry hops out is important. So the dry hopping schedule is as follows. On day three of fermentation, I'm going to open up the fermenter and drop in my first dry hopping charge, which is an ounce and a half of Nectaron. That's gonna go in at day three because we are still actively fermenting. There's no risk of oxidation at this phase, so we should be able to just open the lid of the fermenter, dump the hops in, put it back real easy. We're gonna leave the dry hops on the beer for probably about three to four days. At the end of that dry hopping period, then I'm going to do a soft crash. This is not a full on cold crash, but it's a partial cold crash, bringing us down to the mid 50s Fahrenheit. What this is going to do is separate the yeast out, encourage them to flocculate out and go to the bottom of the fermenter, along with the hop debris as well. This is gonna do a number of things. Number one, it's gonna prime us for our second dry hop. And number two, it's going to prevent hop creep, which is where the enzyme that hops release when they're added to the dry hop, uh, interact with the yeast, cause further fermentation, and often show up as diacetyl later on in the process after you've packaged the beer. It's a nasty thing, easy to avoid if you do a soft crash before your dry hop, and it's also easy to avoid if you use something like ALDC enzyme to get the job done. But this is the process that Twisted Fate is gonna be doing, and I'm gonna try and mirror their process as much as possible. Once I've let the beer soft crash for a day or two, I'm gonna use the bottom port in the conical to dump out the yeast and the hop debris and get that all separated out before adding in my second round of dry hops. At this point, the beer should be finished with its fermentation, which means that there's a risk for oxidation when we add this second charge of dry hops. So what I'll be doing to avoid that is using a hop dropper device. This is the hop bong from more beer that I'll be using, but this purges the oxygen from the chamber with the dry hops. It also purges the oxygen from the hops themselves and prevents you from dragging any further uh, oxygen into the beer in the process. Dave is also doing this on a Unitex, so you're gonna wanna pay attention to your pressures involved. After that first dry hop, I'm actually going to be sealing the unit tank with a PRV in place, of course, for safety. Um, but we're gonna be starting to capture that, that CO2 produced by fermentation to build up pressure. This is gonna prevent us from sucking oxygen into the unit tank when we do that soft crash. And then also what it's going to do is give us a little bit of carbonation in the beer. However, it works against us when it comes to the second dry hop because once you start adding dry hops to a carbonated beer, they start to break apart rapidly and it actually causes a lot of foaming. So if you dump all your dry hops in at the same time, you risk having what's known as a hop volcano. Um, I don't think I need to describe that, it's a big mess. The best way to avoid that is to add a few hops at first, let them dissipate and like initiate that process, let the beer equalize the pressure and stabilize before adding the rest of your hops in. This is what they do at the pro side, so this is what I would recommend doing in the home side as well. You're gonna let that second round of dry hops sit on the beer for another three to four days at that colder temperature of about 55 degrees. And then at that point, transfer the beer over. After optionally cold crashing it, I'll be cold crashing mine to separate the hops out and make the transfer easier. This is a little bit tougher to do if you don't have a unit tank. What I would recommend doing either is fermenting in a keg and then transferring between kegs that have each individual dry hop charge in them. So that you're gonna use like three kegs throughout the process or if you're using a bucket style fermenter, use a magnet technique to drop the dry hops in. I've got a couple videos on this. All you basically do is take your second dry hop charge, put it in a uh, hop bag, and hang it on the top of your fermenter with a uh, food grade silicone magnet, and then secure it with a magnet on the outside of the fermenter. You'll put this in at the same time as your first dry hop addition, uh, so that you don't have to worry about opening your fermenter a second time, and then you can drop those dry hops out. The only problem is you might be leaving your first dry hop 
definition in your beer longer than you want to. So if there is a way for you to transfer between containers, oxygen free to get the job done, then that would actually be better. Regardless, once that beer is completely finished fermentation, it is absolutely imperative to do a closed transfer to a keg or to do an oxygen free uh, packaging process if you're gonna be bottling it or canning it. Uh, these beers are so sensitive to oxygen, it's absolutely unbelievable how fast they can spoil if you're not taking care of them. So just do your best to try and take care of them. One of the best ways to prevent oxygen from entering your beer is to add a little bit of ascorbic acid either in the mash, which is what I do, or with your dry hop charges to help uh, basically just get rid of that oxygen and scrub it uh, a little bit. That's a nice cheap insurance and something that I do highly recommend doing on any oxygen sensitive beer. It's very complicated stuff, but if you have more questions on how to do this on the homebrew scale uh, with your setup, please feel free to ask those questions in the comment section and either myself or someone else will get back to you uh, to help you out with your problems. I'm hoping this beer turns out real nice and I'm really looking forward to it. So I'll catch you in a few weeks when it's ready. Fermentation for this beer went very fast and honestly, it went exactly on schedule. I added my first round of dry hops on day three and then I added a spunding valve at the same time set to about 10 PSI to start building up some pressure in the fermenter. After letting the dry hops sit on the beer for about three days, I started the process of the soft crash, gradually bringing everything down to about 55 degrees and allowing it to sit there for about another 24 hours. And then I dumped out the yeast and the hop material from the first dry hop. On day eight, I added my second round of dry hops, avoiding a hop volcano successfully. At this point, I let the dry hops sit on the beer for another three to four days before cold crashing for another day and then transferring with a closed transfer into a keg after dumping the rest of the dry hop material out the bottom of the conical. This process is complicated, but it works. By doing this way, I avoided any sort of oxygen exposure throughout the entire fermentation process, and I was also able to transfer into my keg with a closed transfer without any sort of clogging from hot material building up. So the beer is called Misty Mountain Hops, and it comes in at 6.5% ABV, and as calculated, 21 IBUs. The appearance of the beer is a light golden color, which I found to be pretty appealing. It's quite hazy. I wouldn't say it's completely opaque. However, it definitely has quite a solid haze to it. And of course, has fantastic head buildup and head retention due to the massive amount of flaked grains we have in this beer. Uh, overall, looks exactly the part. So now let's go in for aroma. This beer is so aromatic. It is a tropical fruit punch of aroma. Um, and it's just so cool. It's got so much different character in it. I mean, I get a little bit of that malt, um, but I really get a punch of lots of like mango and tropical fruit and peach. Like a little bit of lychee, I think, character. Yeah, it's really nice. So now let's go in for mouthfeel. <laughs> it's got a super fluffy, soft character to it. Very soft edges on it. Very, uh, not creamy necessarily, but like pillowy mouthfeel. Um, really, really pleasant to drink. Really makes this uh, super, super light on the bitterness and really, really hits that uh, juice flavor and hammers it home. That large amount of flaked grain that we added in is a lot of the reason why it's so fluffy, but also the water profile. That high chloride to sulfate ratio is one of the reasons why it's so soft on the palate. It's like drinking a cloud. Aroma's on point, mouthfeel's on point. Let's see about the flavor. <laughs> oh. 
and the flavor's on point too. So firstly, I'm getting loads of tropical fleshy fruits, stone fruits, uh, things like papaya, mango, those things are really prominent in this. I'm getting a lot of like a peach-like character or a nectarine-like character. And I'm definitely getting melon, like uh, cantaloupe, actually. And it's so juicy in the flavor that I'm getting. There's definitely a background kind of citrus orange juicy character as well. Um, and then a little bit of lychee, just like in the aroma. So there's a little bit of like a citrus note in here as well, like a lime, I think, is really what I'm getting uh, out of it, which makes sense, because New Zealand hops often throw that lime kind of character. It's definitely got a balanced bitterness to it. It makes the beer work really well, but the predominant hop character is that flavor. It's so juicy. There's also a nice satisfying finish with maltiness. It's either the Belgian base malts or the wheat and the oats coming through, maybe us all of them, um, but it leaves you with this really nice kind of white bread and slight biscuit note in there. Maybe that's the caramel malt that we added um, that's coming through and it's so satisfying because it finishes on the malt note, not on the hop note. So you're actually left wanting more of the hop note at the end of it, and it encourages you to take another sip. The way this beer is set up right now, it is so freaking drinkable. Because this beer is lower alcohol, actually, than I intended, it actually feels super easy to drink, super crushable, if you will, and it's perfect for this time of year. It's perfect for when the weather's warmer. Granted, this is only like a 10 ounce glass, but it certainly goes by fast. The beer goes by so fast, honestly, I had to just go back and get some more. While certainly at first I looked at missing my original gravity by a few points as a bad thing, it actually feels much more like a good thing now because I have a 6.5% beer instead of a 7% beer, and that makes it a lot easier to drink. As far as criticism for the beer goes, I think I only have one, and that is the uh, aromatic intensity of the beer makes you think that it's going to be a high flavor intensity of hops, but it doesn't necessarily match that. Um, so it's a lighter hop flavor. You're still certainly getting lots of it, but it's more akin to like a beefy pale ale as opposed to like a full on hazy IPA. So I would recommend if you're brewing this beer yourself that you include a 10 minute boil edition of all three hops in this. I think that would get you the necessary extra flavor to balance out with the aromatic intensity of the beer, and that would make it a much, much more complete product. And of course, if you want to hit your 7% ABV target like the recipe originally was supposed to, I'd actually recommend increasing the amount of base malts slightly to get you to that point so that you still can use 8.5 gallons of water and you still have a full 5 gallon yield at the end of the process. The fermenter losses on this beer were a good half gallon due to all those hops in there, so just keep that in mind when you're tweaking the recipe for yourself. But otherwise, this beer is absolutely fantastic. It is super crushable. It is a perfect beginning of summer beer. This beer tastes like tropical juices and I'm so happy that I have it on tap. It was really, really fun to use all New Zealand hops and you know, it really does remind me of a lot of those treehouse beers. I think if I changed the grist a little bit and added a few more boil additions, this could be very close to some treehouse beers out there, especially their New Zealand types. Anyway, guys, if you enjoyed the video and if you learned something, please go ahead, hit that like button and don't forget to subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. Comment down below if you enjoyed this video if you enjoyed the way these hops present themselves if you've used them before please let me know i'd love to talk with you guys about it if you want to support the channel please consider picking up a t-shirt like this one you can find this design and plenty of others down in the merchandise store which is in the description box for the video i also have a patreon and my patrons are the reason why i can upgrade my production quality and you have my greatest thanks if patreon's not your thing i also have channel memberships and of course there's the super thanks button as a very quick and easy way to help donate towards the production quality of my channel. It all goes back into it and I really appreciate it nonetheless. I also have an Amazon store where you can find a lot of the brewing equipment that I use as well as the production equipment that I keep talking about. So if you're curious about it, it's all on that store. I'm also available on social media as The Apartment Brewer on both Instagram and Facebook. So feel free to follow me there for some more frequent content updates and uh, some surprises as well. And last but certainly not least, if you guys are still here, thank you for watching all the way to the end of the video. It means a lot to me. These things take a long time to produce and they are definitely hard to work around my busy schedule, but I'm doing the best I can, and I'm glad you guys are appreciating it by watching the whole thing. So this one goes out to you guys, and I'll catch you all in the next one. So until then, cheers. Oh, it's a good beer.